So now that we have a strong basis on the terminology associated with population genetics, let's go right back into our idea of populations by entitling our next flowchart Populations Roman Numeral 2. And we're actually continuing our discussion on alleles, so we're just going to subtitle this uh, flowchart Alleles. But more specifically now, we're going to actually be focusing on allele frequencies. This is a big, big topic, so we'll say allele frequency, um, and this is going to actually be over what we call generations. So we're going to see the differences in allele frequency, how much the allele shows up within populations in a couple of different um, uh, important examples. So we'll get to it. The first example we have to understand is the following. So let me give you a scenario, an example. Let's imagine we have plants and we also have uh, associated flower colors with those plants. These plants have an associated flower color um, and this is going to be represented as a phenotype, a physically seen variable trait and I'll tell you that the phenotypes possible will be very simple. There will be red flower color which is dominant or greater than what we would say white phenotype or flower color. So red is dominant to white, that is our phenotype, our physical variation that we see. Of course, if you mention phenotype, you must, of course, now define what? The genotype. And we can simply define the genotype, and this is, again, made up, but it's an important uh, distinction, an important example to understand, because it's going to really drive home the idea of what it means to look at allele frequencies. The genotype in this situation, I'll tell you, is simple and uh, occurs as in the following format. We have these possible genotypes, and of these possible genotypes, two of them will represent my dominant trait because they uh, contain our dominant allele, capital A. Capital A, um, just because I didn't mention it, just purposes of understanding, will usually refer to dominance, and thus these will be our dominant red color flowers. What about this one? This one will, of course, be now the recessive color white flower. So we have red color, white color, genotype, phenotype, all set. Okay, so let's do what comes naturally as a geneticist and uh, commit ourselves to a cross, okay? So let's do a very basic cross between um, two, I will say, heterozygotes. So our cross will be uh, the following. It will be low, capital A, lowercase a, crossed with capital A, lowercase a. So two heterozygotes, we have mom and dad. They are each going to give, and there's a possibility of them uh, passing on certain gametes. So we always go to the gametic level. So we're starting off as a diploid individual that is crossing with another diploid individual. But that diploidy has to be split in half, right? Because we have to get to haploid. And thus the possible gametes of our parent population, this is uh, P right here, our parent population will be what? The possible gametes are from, let's say this is dad, what possible gametes does he have? We have to divide this in half, so that would be capital A. What else does he have? He also has lowercase a. Well, what about mom? Same exact thing, so capital A lowercase a. So these are our gametes. This is essentially our pool of genes that we can pick from that are going to be involved in associating an allele frequency to this potential uh, individual offspring. So these are our gametes. What are we going to do with these gametes? Well, what I'm going to tell you is that the total number of alleles then, based off of our gametes, are how many? How many possible alleles are there in this entire parent population? There are one, two, three, four. Four independent alleles, two from mom, two from dad, that are going to be within this parent population. This is an important number because now we're going to see the frequency, and this is really easy if you just think about it, the frequency of, let's say, a capital A. Capital A. Let's look at the frequency of capital A. How many of these gametes, thus how many of these alleles present, are capital A? You would say that two out of four represent themselves as capital A. And you would also say then that the other two out of four, aka these, this, and this, represent themselves as lowercase a. You have officially created frequencies. You have officially contrived and figure out the allele frequencies of the parents, okay? The allele frequencies of the parents as two heterozygous individuals are the following. 
frequency of capital A in the parent is equal to, so we have, uh, what do we have here? Capital A, 2 out of 4, so that gives me 0 0.5, right? And what about over here? Frequency of our lowercase a is what? 0 0.5, because it's 2 out of the 4. Very simple, very easy. What is the purpose of understanding this? Well, let's look at something I think a little bit more interesting. Let's imagine that um, we have this cross, and that cross will be defined as, you know, the basic Punnett square that you all know very well how to do. So we'll just quickly do that Punnett square, and we're going to come up with a couple of different offsprings, actually. We're going to have four possible offsprings. Hopefully this is coming to you as easy as I'm, be I'm able to do this. We have actually four possible offsprings from this parent cross. This is essentially our F1 generation, uh, this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. So there are four possible offsprings. So we're actually going to write down that there are four offspring, but now I want you to understand something. How many possible alleles are there from these offspring? Imagine these offspring grow up and have the potential to reproduce, and they produce their own gametes. How many individual gametes have we made? We have one from here, another one here, 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 aka we have two for each possible offspring, just like we had two for each possible parent. So now two possible gametes, two possible, um, let's say, uh, alleles for each offspring gives us a total number of alleles, so we'll say total number of alleles is equal to what? It's equal to eight. So we've gone from four to eight. What was the purpose of this? Well, the purpose of this is to show you the following. Even though we have increased the number of alleles, I guarantee you that when I look at the frequencies of the alleles, they will be the exact same as the parents, aka this frequency that we contrived and came up with based off of our idea of allele frequencies will be the same in both the parent cross and in the total offspring. What do I mean by this? Well, simply speaking, if we look at the offspring, how many capital A alleles do we have within the four possible offspring, within the eight possible alleles? Well, we actually have, uh, let me count, one, two, three, not that one, four, none of those. So we have four out of how many? Eight. So four out of eight are equal to capital A, just like we did here. Nothing crazy right now. On the other side of this, um, we have, what, four out of eight are going to equal lowercase a, just like one, two, three, don't count that, four. So four out, of eight equal, uh, four out of eight is equal to lowercase a. I told you and I promised you that they're going to be the same frequencies as their parents. Do we see that? Well, of course we do. Of course I'm right, because frequency of capital A, four out of eight, is still equal to 0 0.5. Frequency of lowercase a is equal to 0 0.5. We have maintained the frequency, the frequency of the alleles, though we have gone to the offspring generation. Right over here, you can write offspring. I can't really write sideways on this. Right over here, you can write parents. We can divide them sort of like this just to show that there's a difference. But at the same uh, sense of it, what we've established here is the following rule. We've established, and I'm actually, I ran out of space here, so I'm going to write the rule over here, that this is a very important idea to understand when we're talking about microevolution. Um, the relative allele frequency, uh, the relative allele frequencies do not change. They do not change. And I'm going to box this in because this is a big key idea that we're going to further prove as we move forward with another example that I'll do in the next video. So just to summarize and recap, we came up with plants and flowers, uh, you know, and their flower colors as the possible allele that we're interested in. We established this phenotype, red is dominant to white, we have these genotypes, cool. We did a parent cross. Out of those parent cross, two individuals, we have four possible gametes because each individual has two possible uh, alleles because of this idea of a diploid species. This is a diploid species, nothing crazy. And we came up with these frequencies. And we maintained those frequencies within our offspring. Let's imagine that these parents have four kids, and for the purposes of this example, four plants, plant offspring, all four represent themselves as like exactly how we expect. This, 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 and this. 
even though they all represent as different genotypes, or relatively different genotypes, two of them are the same, that's besides the point, they will still represent with the same frequencies, right here, right here, right here, and right here. This is a very important idea of microevolution that's going to play a big role as we continue our discussion. Um, in the next video, we're going to continue looking at an example to further drive home the point of this relative allele frequencies not changing over uh, time, over these generations, if everything is held constant. And we'll see what I mean by that as we move forward.